Gut, das Thema ist Nachkommen von NS-Verfolgten als Impulsgeber für die Erinnerungskultur. Ich bin froh, wir haben hier Teilnehmer aus England, Russland und Polen dabei. Michael Newman, kannst du bitte beginnen mit deinem Input? Um, it's, uh, this subject is, uh, I actually struggled quite, quite a bit with this one, how to, to answer it. And As much as I try to give a definitive answer, which is very difficult, I actually thought it led to a number of sub-questions. So if you look at the initiation and the practice of remembrance culture by descendants, I think some, un some questions underneath that could be, were or are the descendants alone responsible for remembrance culture? Does this imply that the survivors and the refugees played little or no role in the memorialization of the Holocaust? Can different generations take different levels of responsibility or credit for the development of remembrance culture? What do we understand by remembrance culture and might there be differences depending on the country in which the descendants live? I think this is something we touched upon this morning. And lastly, what do we discern as the differences between initiating and practicing and now as we reach to the fourth generation and it may be in some perhaps more orthodox communities even the fifth and I even know of the sixth generation uh, we are moving from living memory to history should we add where the remembrance culture is being perpetuated so I think we have to start with a bit of context why why survivors, why it could be that survivors are somehow accused of the charge leveled at them that they didn't practice remembrance culture. And again, I, like again the speakers this morning, I'm looking at this from the perspective of one country in the UK, but of course there may be differences. So of course, immediately after the Second World War the Holocaust, there was the Cold War, Uh, politically, socially, culturally, countries had a different focus. The survivors and the refugees had a different focus. Naturalization, employment, raising families, rebuilding lives. Some or many first generation, as we heard, never told their stories. And so it's been left to the descendants to tell. There was also a limited and an indifferent audience. There wasn't the that people were not interested to hear. The fact that people had come as emigrant, emigres or survivors, that was their problem. Countries, their host countries, had their own problems to deal with. Uh, Holocaust education, of course, was not mandatory, as it is in many countries today. Uh, and it, although there were, of course, some accounts, some eyewitness accounts, There wasn't a mass gathering of testimonies as there has been in subsequent years. And then I looked at whether there were arguments for the descendants initiating remembrance culture. And being from that third generation, I thought it was easiest for me to focus on that particular generation. That's not to say that first or second may have done as well. But because I'm third generation, I can make a case for the generation that came of age around the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, 
typically the third generation, as being the ones who have taken most of the responsibility. The third generation onwards are taught the subject in schools, some mandatory. They're also at a healthier distance to their grandparents than their own parents were. They don't have the issues of being second generation that were touched on this morning. Again, to counter what I mentioned before, there is now a willing and receptive audience. Uh, I think it was Ava who cited earlier that one of the people who came to see her for a therapy didn't want to be identified as a victim. Uh, there's also a, an access to a wealth of archives, bringing awareness of the history of the Holocaust. This is particularly more so post-communism. And increasing in anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial, there is a need to combat and counter these distortions. And that, I think, acts as a motivation for people. So in the UK, I can observe the phenomenon of interest having skipped the generation. But I also wonder whether the fourth generation will be as interested, because by the time it gets to them, their great-grandparents will probably have passed away, and they won't have the physical connection or memory. Uh, there's also the argument that some second generation actively discouraged conversation with the third generation who may have been unaware of their family past and conversation was simply closed down. My grandmother, the refugee for example, pointedly never spoke to my father about her experiences and every time he asked a question she closed down the conversation. So it's a very hard to engage. There were some separate arguments about survivors initiating remembrance culture, which is that some survivors did of course talk and made don donations of documents and memorabilia. And now I observe uh, almost a sprint. There is a, am I, am I going too, no. too long? Okay. Um, there's almost a sprint now, a desperate attempt to gather as many testimonies as possible. Yeah. And of course survivors are still giving talks to press and to schools which feeds educational awareness, which feeds remembrance culture. Um, a couple of other observations. I mentioned before about the country. In the UK, of course, we, we make a big thing about having won the Second World War. So history is written by the victors, they say. So this has an, an, an extra element of another layer to another dynamic. Um, and it's enabled remembrance culture to flourish. Last time I was here, I talked about having visited Bosnia where remembrance culture is closed down. They're not yet ready to talk about the atrocities that happened there. So overall, I found it almost impossible to argue, to make a case one way or the other. But just two final thoughts. One is that maybe it's not specific to one generation or another, but maybe to an era, as I mentioned, the, the post-communist era. And also, on a slightly more philosophical note, remembrance culture itself adapts, and so it's different today as it would have been immediately post-war. Now, of course, there's a need and a craze to capture every moment of everybody's life, which definitely wasn't the case. 70 years ago. I think I'll stop. Ich übergebe das Wort an unsere russische Teilnehmerin aus Russland, Olga Kuinchenko. Good afternoon, everybody. I work for the Academic Center for Oral History and primarily we'll talk about our work. Um, is it okay? Like, is it okay for yeah, the yeah, sound? Yeah. <coughs> um, and this is because when I started to prepare uh, for this final uh, conference, for this final day, I decided to look for information. What kind of organizations do we actually have within Russian Federation who works with descendants? And I realized that there are few. For instance, there is a science of, um, state science academy, of course. It's a very respectful organization which has its um, branches all over the country. Then we have International Memorial 
which is very influenced and important for our country, and remembrance culture too. What else do we have? Humans, uh, human Rights Center, Holocaust Center, which is located in uh, Moscow, and I know for sure that, for instance, the head of the center worked very hard in order to prepare tons of literature in order to provide it to school teachers so they could teach about the Holocaust at school. Uh, and there is our center, uh, which is already 17 years old. Of course, there are teachers um, in Russian schools and teachers at Russian universities who work with this topic, but I figured out that we're not very well connected. We don't know, actually, that somewhere in Novosibirsk, in Novosibirsk there is a teacher who works with descendants already. So this is our first problem. I will talk about the next one a bit later. And regarding our work, uh, I would divide it into two parts. It's educational and cultural. In cultural dimension, we, we work with uh, collecting memories of former forced laborers and then make exhibitions. We also work with Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum and have already done one exhibition with them and we expected the second one devoted to the fates of women in Auschwitz in upcoming April. So, exhibition. And I mentioned that we worked with former forced laborers who brought our, who brought to us our, uh, their documents and photographs. And then, as exhibition was opened, they came to this event with their children. And there were three women who gave information about their past experience only on the day of this event. So we figured out that it was uh, a secret topic, like a taboo topic in their families. And here I drive your attention to the second problem, the problem of silence in our society. So we have this gap between those people who experienced sufferings on occupied territories of the Soviet Union, who had to present forced labor on the territory of the Third Reich and then was driven to Soviet camps. They didn't speak to their children. And we have this gap which lasts from the first generation to the third and the fourth. We work with educational projects. And one of them is a school project which is called We and Our Past. Me and my colleague lead this club for three years already, and actually we have it for seven years. Um, and we work at school with testimonies that were collected by our center and also which are the, uh, the part of huge online archive, Forced Labor 1939-1945. On the basis of this archive was created online educational platform, and we also realized that it's the best thing to reach the second, third, and fourth generation. And there, is a, uh, there are some reasons why. For instance, if you imagine that a person is looking for information about his mother or father, who, for example, passed away, he is looking for resource. Fortunately, there are among 10 or 12 online resources in our country which, is, which has great amount of documents of former forced laborers, even those who were in the Third Reich. And they found this uh, resource, forced labor, 1939-1945. <coughs> and then, while he's registering, he describing his problem. Afterwards, we contact this person and provide him or her with information or with the list of resources where he or she could address to and though we help them to find some information, or at least a line, or at least we provide them with a tool how to look for or seek for uh, necessary information about their ancestors. Um, we also figured out that um, during the 70 years we have been working with the second and third generation already. 
because whenever we invite foreign visitor, a lecturer who is represented, uh, who, rep who is a representative person of a memorial or museum or educational center or institute, we invite to our public lectures all of the people who are interested in this problem, who is interested in remembrance culture or problem or forced labor and etc. and etc. or who is interested in uh, educational problems. Driving your attention to educational line of our work, I would like to mention educational seminars with Auschwitz Birkenau State Museum. We already mentioned that there were four people, descendants of survivors, who found their relatives with our help and visited Auschwitz Birkenau, regardless their relatives were in captivity in some other camps. They just um, told us that they need to be somewhere, even though he is not coming to Buchenwald, he's coming to Auschwitz, so he could touch this memorial, touch this place, and maybe feel something that had felt his ancestor. So I guess um, I, I can speak about our work for a long time, but I guess our project, online archive, and well, there are 10 interviews in this archive made by Oral Center for uh, Academic Center for All History. Um, but still, well, just keep in mind that remembrance culture in Russia is very diverse, and sometimes we struggle of lack of not only lack of information, but also lack of space for giving the voice to speak to those people who are descendants. Um, my name is Maria Buko. I, I am from Poland, so perfect match. <laughs> ich möchte, Moment, ich möchte vielleicht hinzufügen, dass äh, wir haben äh, gebeten, Maria vor kurzem, und dass sie äh, sich nicht so vorbereiten musste, um sie improvisieren. Deswegen möchte ich mich sehr bedanken. <lacht> Uh, well, I hope I hope this will be a fruitful um, speech, even though it's unprepared. So I work uh, in a history meeting house, uh, a cultural institution uh, based in Warsaw, uh, where I work in an uh, oral history archive. So I'm a researcher, but at the same time I pursue my PhD thesis. So I'm also an academic, but I also consider myself an activist. <laughs> Uh, my, my research is uh, about second generation of um, Polish political prisoners of Nazi concentration camps, so to be specific, uh, non-Jewish victims of war. Uh, and speaking about remembrance culture, well, of course, us in Russia, uh, the, after the war we had another layer of, um, <coughs> well, political context for remembrance. So, of course, the, the families that I've researched uh, experienced both uh, being victimized by uh, World War II and then by the communist regime. And then uh, they, fight, well, they pursued different attitudes towards the transformation period and what, what happened after 1989 and as some of them have different attitudes towards what's happening politically in Poland now. Um, so um, that's, that's the context. Um, and speaking about uh, remembrance culture, um, we've already talked about it in the previous session, but, but I would like to say it once, once again. Um, to talk about remembrance culture, we first must acknowledge different groups of victims and um, it really was a problem for me during my research, a uh, problem or a, I don't know, uh, a challenge, rather a challenge, um, to handle the fact that some of my interviewees uh, literally talked about their experiences for the first time to me a young researcher and activist. Uh, and um, many of them told me that they've never uh, ever before thought of, of, uh, about themselves as uh, victims or a second generation of victims. 
um, they considered their personal problems uh, or family problems as an um, um, well, just a personal issue, and only uh, only recently, when the, um, the, the discussion and the public discourse appeared about the uh, Jewish second generation, um, they they read the books, saw the movies, and they saw some uh, intense, striking uh, similarities. Of course, up to a point, but still they saw some similarities, and they only then started to think about themselves as vic like children of victims of war, of persecution, and they started to reflect on whether the uh, war experience of their parents had or was the reason why their parents behaved uh, this way or that way. So, um, for m many of my interviewees um, meeting with me and um, I conducted narrative biographical interviews. So giving these interviews was the first, ta first uh, possibility to reflect on their life stories and to understand them with my poor support because I'm not a psychotherapist. Um, but still, it was an important experience for me and for them as well. Mm, and uh, what I wanted to, to put more boldly is that, okay, me as a young academic, I know uh, that there are books about uh, transgenerational trauma of different groups of victims. Uh, I know it, but the general public in Poland doesn't know it yet, even the victims themselves. So I think that, that to, start, to start, in fact, a remembrance culture, we need to first reach the, the victims uh, and we have many of like victims, different groups of victims in Poland, and but we have to reach them. And uh, I think it's the it's the challenge for us, the researchers and educators, and activists, um, to reach them first and to um, uh, provide them psychosocial support. Yes, but also to offer them possibility to share their experiences in a project that would be fruitful in teaching about human rights while there are already ready different groups of activists in Poland who would would like to or like it's easy for them to use this uh, this word trauma this frustration this feeling of injustice uh, all the negative emotions that uh, run in the many families in Poland uh, to use it in a um, 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 <laughs> 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 I would rather say national, like nationalist agenda. That's what, that's what I wanted to say. Like um, I'm, I'm always referring to some of my interviewees with whom I don't fully agree with as conservatives, but of course it's an euphemism. But I'm trying to understand um, different um, experiences, uh, attitudes. <laughs> being grateful for sharing their stories with me. Uh, <coughs> uh, but still, that, that I think is the challenge for me as an educator, um, to use these narrations in a reasonable, sensible way. Um, but it's also a challenge because some of my interviewees expect me, well, I already told Nora about it uh, in, during the lunch break, some of my interviewees expect me to use their stories in a different political context, in a different education. And that's a challenge for a researcher in such a troubled political context, like in Poland. So, uh, am, am I running out of time? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just, I just, uh, like, I just, that one last thing, I just, I, of course there are, there are interviewees that, um, that are aware of their trauma, of the burden, and they are politically or, um, or um, active in a political education, historical education, but I, like, not, I don't like to generalize, but most of them are conservatives, let's say, and they are already doing their political educational work. What I think is uh, more, more, I don't know, interesting or promising is the group that f 
for now tells me that they are not ready to be politically active or to share their stories, I don't know, with, with pupils at schools. But still, they told, because they told me, um, many of them told me, we've da um, I'm done with my family story, it was a challenge, uh, but I'm, for, for now I think I'm quite good and I'm, I'm done with the trauma of my parents. But I will share this story with you, and you, you deal with it later. And I hope that you will do it in the, in the way that I expect you to do, to use it. <laughs> and some of them expect me to use it in uh, education about human rights. Like, of course, it's not that that all the Polish victims are that frustrated. But um, uh, I think it's a challenge for educators to, to use these narratives to op open these wounds, uh, like maybe only once, and then deal with the, with the material on, the, the, on their own, not to force the fresh, freshly created or freshly um, awoken victims uh, to go, uh, go around schools themselves and to teach mm -hmm. about the war. Auch in Tschechien beobachte ich äh, die Tendenz, dass man, äh, ich habe von äh, Instrumentalisieren von Emotionen gesprochen, aber auch die Lebensgeschichten werden instrumentalisiert natürlich und das ist eine große Verantwortung und wenn Sie damit rechnen, es wird zum, äh, zum Bildung, zum Menschenrechte verwendet, ist es äh, in Ordnung und ich hoffe, es wird auch so bleiben und nicht eine Unterstützung zu anderen äh, Strömungen. Und äh, ich wollte auch äh, an die anderen hier eine Frage stellen, ob Sie vielleicht wissen oder aus Ihrer Praxis wissen von einem erfolgreichen Projekt äh, mit Nachkommen, was die po politische Bildung angeht. Und ich sehe hier Nora, möchte, <lacht> und das freut mich, äh, vielleicht wenn, das, das ist meine Frage an Plenum und auch an Sie. Und ich gebe, übergebe das Wort an Nora Hespas, bitte. Ähm, genau, auf deine Frage zu antworten. Ich glaube, viele von uns sind wirklich noch Einzelkämpfer. Also ich bin nur durch Zufall zum Beispiel auf die NS-Beratung gekommen, weil Freunde von mir ähm, ein Foto gemacht haben. Ich habe das sehr gut kenne und ich habe sie auf einer Postkarte entdeckt. Sonst wäre diese Kooperation nie zustande gekommen. Ja? Das ist Zufall gewesen. Ich habe einfach irgendwann angefangen mit meiner Geschichte und mit meinem Podcast und mit meinem Blog und ich wusste nicht, wo da draußen noch andere sind. Das ist total schwierig. Anknüpfungspunkte zu finden. Ich finde einen Punkt, den Maria gesagt hat, total wichtig. Sie sagt, Menschen entdecken gerade, dass sie Opfer sind oder Nachfragen von Opfern durch Medien, also durch Filme und ähnliches. Und ich, ich glaube, wir müssen ganz dringend daran arbeiten, dass wir Identifikationsmaterial schaffen für eine Generation, die jetzt lebt. Also nicht Schwarz-Weiß-Filme, irgendwas aus der Vergangenheit, sondern etwas, das jetzt existiert. Und, ähm, das, das schaffen wir, glaube ich, nur gemeinsam. Das schaffen nicht Einzelpersonen, es sei denn, Einzelpersonen haben sehr, sehr viel Geld. Das ist selten der Fall. Ähm, genau, das, äh, was, was wir auch haben in Deutschland, ist, dass jetzt schon Leute anfangen, Narrative umzudeuten. Und das sehr deutlich gesehen in Chemnitz. Ja? Was Nationalisten machen mit Geschichten wie der Weißen Rose. Wenn die anfangen, weil die Geld sammeln, bevor wir die Geschichten erzählen können, haben wir ein echtes Problem. Und ich, ich möchte tatsächlich, ähm, ich fände es toll, wenn wir es irgendwie hinbekämen, uns zu sammeln und nicht mehr als einzelne kleine Initiativen zu arbeiten, sondern als große Stimme. Weil anders, weil die versammeln sich als große Stimme und anders haben wir keine Chance dagegen anzukommen. Eine Freundin von mir, Juna Grossmann, hat jetzt ein Buch veröffentlicht, das heißt Schon Zeit vorbei. Juna ist ähm, Jüdin und macht den Blog irgendwie jüdisch. Und sie ist gefragt worden in einem Interview vor zwei Tagen, warum sie jetzt widerspricht, also warum sie sich so laut macht und so veröffentlicht, obwohl sie alltäglich mit Antisemitismus konfrontiert wird und warum sie, obwohl sie Hassmails bekommt. Und sie sagt, ich kann jetzt nicht darauf hoffen, dass andere das machen, ich will das nicht, aber wir müssen jetzt wieder selber aktiv werden. Das heißt, es sind Menschen, die sich jetzt wieder damit beschäftigen, ob Deutschland ein sicheres Land für sie ist. Ähm, und ich finde, wir haben ein ziemlich großes Problem, das wir irgendwie angehen müssen und für das wir uns, also nicht nur jetzt als Nachfahren, sondern für das wir andere Menschen begeistern müssen, damit sie uns unterstützen, weil es kann eben nicht nur an den Nachfahren liegen oder an einzelnen kleinen Institutionen. Ja. Vielen Dank, bitte. Wie heißt, noch mal das? Wie heißt, noch mal? Wie heißt das Buch? Ähm, schon Zeit vorbei. Ja. Vielen Dank, ich bin Svenja Kranzow-Rauwald, ich arbeite für die KZ-Gedenkstätte Neuengamme. 
in Hamburg. Ich bin aber auch dritte Generation und ähm, mein Anliegen äh, verbindet sich ganz klar mit etwas, was Olga äh, gut auf den Punkt gebracht hat, nämlich äh, Nachkommen eine Stimme zu geben, einen Ort, wo sie gehört werden. Und äh, eins, äh, ein, der, ein Bereich, in dem ich das versuche zu tun, ist auf äh, einem äh, mehrsprachigen Blog, der heißt äh, Reflections on Family History Affected by Nazi Crimes. Und äh, dieser Blog äh, gibt eben wirklich Nachkommen aus äh, Deutschland, aber auch aus verschiedenen europäischen Ländern, die Möglichkeit, ihre Geschichte aus ihrer Perspektive zu erzählen. Einmal natürlich damit dafür zu sorgen, dass die Familiengeschichte an die Öffentlichkeit kommt, aber auch zu zeigen, was es bedeutet, Nachkommen zu sein. Unge äh, ungefiltert in dem Sinne, dass ich lediglich Ihnen zur Seite stehe in äh, dem, wie man etwas strukturieren kann, indem man auch äh, ich dafür Sorge trage, dass Sie auch nicht Dinge erzählen, die vielleicht eigentlich geschützt werden sollten, die zu intim sind. Aber, ähm, und ich habe dankenswerterweise einen Kreis äh, von ehrenamtlichen Übersetzerinnen und Übersetzern, die dafür sorgen, dass wir eben in irgendeiner Form mehrsprachig existieren. Und das finde ich ist erstmal ganz wichtig, auch in Anknüpfung an deinen Punkt und was du gesagt hast, wir müssen uns zeigen. Und äh, denn äh, das Anliegen des Blogs ist, so viele Geschichten wie möglich zu zeigen. Einmal um zu zeigen gegenüber der Gesellschaft, es gibt die Menschen, die betroffen sind von dieser äh, äh, Geschichte. Und es sind die Menschen, die ganz unterschiedliche Dinge daraus ziehen für sich und ihre Positionierung in der Gesellschaft. Und ähm, das äh, ist erstmal einfach ein Projekt, was ich finde, äh, weitergetragen werden muss, damit äh, wir äh, unsere Stimmen bündeln können. Vielleicht an der Stelle? Ja. Ja. Ähm, kann, äh, ich glaube, wir haben jetzt Zeit. In ja, äh, mein Name ist Hans Koppi, ich komme aus Berlin. Und äh, wir haben dort, äh, das heißt wir, das ist die Berliner Vereinigung der Verfolgten des Naziregimes und der Antifaschisten, haben 2012 eine erste Tagung gemacht zur zweiten Generation, da sind heute auch einige dabei äh, und unter anderem äh, waren also auch zwei Frauen aus, äh, oder drei sogar aus London dabei und haben eben auch äh, über diese Gruppe gesprochen, wo vorhin der Kollege aus London äh, über die äh, Second Generation äh, und äh, dann haben wir also erst in diesem Jahr oder im letzten Jahr schon mal, da haben wir immer so einen Erinnerungstag am zweiten Sonntag im September und hatten dort uns mit vielen anderen zur Erinnerungskultur getroffen in der TU in Berlin und hatten dort 14 Workshops gemacht und ein Workshop war dann eben zu den, zu den Nachkommen. Und äh, dort entspann sich dann doch eine interessante Diskussion, äh, zum Beispiel auch von äh, ja, Nachkommen, die jetzt äh, zum Beispiel in Gedenkstätten aktiv sind äh, und dort mitarbeiten und äh, wo einer eben das auch ein bisschen problematisierte und sagte, ja, aber welche Rolle spielen wir da eigentlich? Äh, von äh, Nur, dass wir gewissermaßen das, was die... Leitung dort abnicken oder äh, dass die Mitarbeiter eigentlich von uns noch erwarten, dass wir zuarbeiten, aber wir sind eigentlich nicht einbezogen in, die, in, in das, was in der Gedenkstätte außerhalb der offiziellen äh, Gedenktage dort passiert. Und äh, äh, wir haben jetzt äh, gerade ein Projekt, das heißt äh, Kinder des Widerstands und der Verfolgung, das heißt, wir haben dort eingeladen Leute, die wir kennen und, oder andere auch dazu. Widerstand heißt eben Widerstand aus der Arbeiterbewegung, aber auch aus dem 20. Juli und aus anderen Herkünften. Und dabei sind auch eben eine Gruppe, die nennen sich 
Kämpfer und Freunde der Spanischen Republik, wo eben die Vorfahren die Spanische Republik verteidigt haben. Äh, dabei sind eben auch eine, eine Gruppe, die heißen kurz äh, Sowjet-Exil. Äh, da sind also äh, Nachfahren von 1933 und später äh, vor die Nazis geflogenen und integrierten äh, äh, deutschen Kommunisten, Juden und anderen, äh, wo es dann, die dann auch in diese Repression mitkamen und äh, die also darüber zum Beispiel immer zusammensitzen und sich gegenseitig ihre Geschichten erzählen, also ihre eigenen und, und das ist etwas, äh, was ganz wichtig ist, glaube ich, äh, weil dadurch, dass sie die Geschichten erzählen, äh, werden sie auch etwas los. Ja. Also das, was wir auch... Äh, ich muss mich bedanken und an weitere das Wort ja. Und, äh, und ja. wir haben jetzt eben diese Workshops, in den letzten hatten wir zu diesem ja. Thema auch gemacht, äh, und das, was wir mit diesen Workshops wollen, ist eigentlich, äh, die zu, also noch mehr zu befähigen, selber äh, politische Arbeit, Projekte ja. zu machen und so weiter. Sie und unterstützen sich sozusagen selber oder gehen Sie auch zu der äh, zu den Öffentlichkeit? Erfahren die über Ihre äh, Geschichten oder unterstützen ja, Sie sich als Gruppe selber? Ja. Und, äh, ja. Ich äh, möchte mich entschuldigen. Ja, ich habe nur eine <lacht> Frage zu den Zeitzeugen. Also Aha. das haben Sie erläutert mit Supervision vorher und hinterher und Historikern und so weiter. Das war Idealfall, ja. ja. Das war eine ich, weiß, ja, ich weiß nicht, ob das wirklich der Idealfall ist, weil also ich würde mich dabei nicht wohlfühlen. Ja? Weil, ich, weil ich denke, das ist zu einengend. Ja? Also, aber das ist aber so, der, damit der, meint man eigentlich, dass ich Sie unterbreche, Entschuldigung, meint man auch ein Gespräch mit zum Beispiel nur mit dem Interview vorher vorher, als äh, dieses Treffen äh, beginnt, ja, dass man weiß, was kommt, das muss nicht eine super, ja, 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 ja aber, ja, danke. Ja. Kann ich das Wort bitte? Ja. Mein Name ist Clara Thunkscherer, Jahrgang 46, ein, ich bin also ein echtes Wiedersitzkind, als mein Vater fuchzucht auf nach Hause kam, bin ich neun Monate später geboren. <lacht> ich bin auch in der VVM, aber erst nachdem meine Eltern schon lange gestorben waren, bin ich in die Vereinigung der Verfolgung des Naziregimes gegangen. Und wir hatten von dieser äh, Gruppe VVN NRW, hatten wir mal den Dieter Nelles eingeladen. Und er hat zu den, kind, zu den Interviews äh, Kinder des Widerstandes äh, gesprochen. Und dann haben wir gedacht als Kinder von Widerstandskämpfern, wir müssen uns zusammentun. Wir dürfen nicht das, was unsere Eltern erlitten hatten oder wofür sie auch gekämpft haben, äh, einfach ähm, dahin stehen lassen oder in Vergessenheit geraten lassen. Und mittlerweile, also wir treffen uns viermal im Jahr und auch wenn irgendwas Interessantes ist, auch mal zwischendurch, äh, wir gehen in Schulen und wir haben mittlerweile zwei Broschüren, ich habe sie dummerweise heute nicht mitgenommen, äh, geschrieben und damit das also auch, auch weitergeführt wird, denn es drängt die Zeit, also wir haben also jetzt sogar von den Autoren schon Todesfälle und es, ist, es drängt wirklich die Zeit, dass wir gegen diese Rechtsentwicklung heute angehen und deswegen machen wir das weiter und deswegen auch das Thema äh, Widerstand und also dass wir dieses, dieses enge Thema haben, ähm, als, als Beispiel, dass also auch heute ein Widerstand möglich und nötig ist. Vielen Dank. In uh, 1994, I wrote a book on the rescues of Jews during the Holocaust. And uh, uh, it was, uh, it got many awards, including being nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. The only countries that uh, translated the book were Germany and Czechoslovakia. Countries like France said, oh, we already know about Schindler's List, we don't need a book. And, um, oh, and in other countries they basically just said, well, the book's not going to make any money, so we're not going to translate it. 
but we, uh, we tend to forget the children and the grandchildren of the rescuers of Jews who risked their lives. In many of these countries, they did not want to be awarded the award of the righteous amongst the nations by the state of Israel because they were still afraid of their neighbors, particularly in Eastern Europe uh, and some even in Western Europe that their neighbors were going to be after them. Some of them had to move to other small, if they were from a small town, they had to move to another small town so that nobody would know them. And I think that this group, if we're talking about the second and third generation, needs to begin to have a voice and that they need to be proud of their, of their children. And we know that in many cases, their children, grandchildren, don't even know who their grandparents were. I, I hope I can get an answer from you because I have a problem. Yes. She's a therapist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> She's too expensive and too far away. Um, first of all, first of all, um, I, I, I understood from the discussion that there is a, 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 a danger, let's say, of abusing narratives. Yeah. And I understood that from all of what you said. Uh, Britons, they are the victory country, with Churchill's V. Uh, oh, the, sorry, the other way around. That's <laughs> another seminar. Um, and the second, uh, um, uh, sec secondly, talking about the role of the Soviet Union, and none of us would have been sitting here if the Red Army mm -hmm. wouldn't have liberated uh, Auschwitz and would have come to Berlin. Right you. A second? Right you. Yes, but the, but the, <laughs> but, but I think yeah, that the understanding, the understanding of uh, who has won Second World War, the Soviet Union and the Red Army, which is problematic, of course, Stalinist and everything, uh, is not somewhere on the background. And we really think the Britons did it, and maybe the US, they gave chewing gum afterwards. So there is a, there is a problem. They arrived late. They arrived late. So there is a problem. Again, here we have, the, we have a historical problem in the knowledge. And someone, an activist, that would be interested what, how do you define yourself, but an activist from Poland, where we know um, it is under penalty to say that Poland, uh, Polish people contributed to uh, a national socialist activities, to say, to say very neutral, is a dangerous thing. So this is the, the basic of my irritation, the base of my irritation. I, I, I really have a, I want, would like to translate the German word Unwohlsein. I don't know how to say it. Unwellbeing. Unwell and then the second unwellbeing, I, I, I read your question, the sentence, or your, your statement, the sentence is a driving force for remembrance culture. And uh, there is a saying that anti-Semitism is not a problem to Jews, but is a problem of those who are anti-Semites. Anti I, I fully understand if people want to tell their stories, if they want to spread what they have, uh, uh, what they have been through. But I have, this is my question. I have a problem with the idea that they are the driving forces. I would wish, maybe it's wishful thinking, that someone else would have done it. Maybe activists, maybe people who are not involved so much. And now we have someone from the third generation from, from uh, working in the, in the Gedenkstätte, in the, in, the, in the concentration camp. We have a lot of people here who are sort of con uh, involved and have, uh, but is it our hobby? Is it what we want to do? And I think we have to